This presentation looks at one sample t-test for means and we are looking at examples in context. Word problems. We have to establish fairness and in order to perform a one sample t-test for the mean we must satisfy the conditions of the central limit theorem. So either n must be large, that is more than 30, or in the case that n is small the underlying data set must be normally distributed. So here's an example where we're going to look at ACT scores and in 2001 the mean ACT score for the composite was 21 and a researcher believes that the students in his state are above average. So he randomly selects 40 students from his state and collects these statistics. So from 40 students the average was 21.7 and the standard deviation is 5.1. Now remember when you flip a coin 10 times you expect to get 5 heads but you could get 6 just by random chance. If the mean is 21, could we get 21.7 just by random chance, or is that such an extreme number that the mean probably wasn't 21? That's what we want to consider. So he is going to ask whether or not the students in his state are above average with respect to the ACT composite score. So the first thing we have to ask ourselves is what is the null hypothesis and what is the alternate hypothesis? So in 2001, the mean composite was 21. So we're going to compare our mean against 21. And he wants to see if his students are above average. That is going to indicate a one-tail test where we want to show that the mean is greater than that value. So the H0, again, mu equals 21. So mu represents the average composite ACT for all students in that state. He's comparing that against 21 versus what he hopes is going to happen is that the average for all the students in his state is actually more than 21. So our next notion is to compute the test statistic. So here's the statistics that we were given. And there's the formula that we need, x bar minus mu divided by s over root n. So x bar, 21.7, minus mu, we're comparing mu to 21, minus 21, divided by s, 5.1, over the square root of n, over the square root of 40. And how are we going to compute this? We are going to go to Excel. So you will notice I put in some headers, x bar, mu, s, n, and t. And I put the numbers underneath that we have for our statistics. And I'm going to write a little line of code here. t is going to equal x bar, click on this one, minus mu, click on this one, divided by s over root n, so divided by s, divided by the square root of n, s. Q R T of the n value and the n value is right here and what will that give us that will give us 0.868 so 0.868 is our test statistic so what's our next step we want to find the p-value. So there's H0 and HA, our statistics and our test statistic. The key thing here is looking at HA, that's saying mu is greater than 21, so that is a one-tailed test to the right. We're going to take our test statistic and we're going to find the area to the right of that test statistic because of the fact this is a one-tailed test to the right. So our degrees of freedom are n minus 1, n is 40. 40 minus 1 is 39. We have a t with 39 degrees of freedom. So t with 39, test statistic is 0.6868. To find our p-value, we've got to find the area where the arrow is pointing. So how much area do we have in that part of the graph? So we're going to ask the computer to do CDF 0.868, semicolon t39, period. And Minitab comes back with 0.8046. So 0.8046 corresponds to all of this area. And then we can use that to find the p-value. We notice the entire area has to be 1. So if this is 0.8046, the p-value is 1 minus 0.8046, or 0.1954. So now we have to either state reject H0 or fail to reject H0. Our p-value is 0.1954. That's a large p-value. Remember, for the most part, we're going to say a p-value is large if it's greater than 0.05. We're going to say it's small if it's less than 0.05. A 
occasionally we'll use 0.01 as our standard, but the primary version we're going to use is 0.05. So the p-value is large relative to 0.05, and if the p-value is large, we fail to reject H0. So what exactly does that mean? Well, he wanted to show that his students were above average, but we can't throw out H0, which means maybe his students are average. The way I'd like you to write this is, there is insufficient evidence to conclude that students from his state, from this state, are above average on the ACT composite score. They could just simply be average. We don't have enough evidence to say that they are above average. Okay, next we're going to look at restaurant bills. You're going to attend a trade show, and your primary competitor claims that the average bill in his restaurant chain is 78.26. And you want to see how your restaurant compares to his. So you're going to ask the question, is the mean of the bills in your restaurant different from the mean of the bills in his? So you're going to randomly select 100 bills from your restaurant, and you're going to find of those 100 bills, the average was $83.41, with a standard deviation of 25.1. So now you want to establish the null hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis. So his average is 78.26, and you want to see if yours is significantly different. Different could mean higher, different could be less, could be lower. So your H0 here comparing against 78.26 but your HA is going to be mu is not equal to 78.26. This, of course, is a two-tailed test. So there's our H0 and HA, and there are our statistics. To compute the test statistic T, we're going to take X bar minus mu divided by S over root N. X bar, 83.41, minus mu, 78.26 divided by S, 25.1, over root N, over root 100. And we are going to do that computation on Excel. So I'm going to type over my X bar, 83.41. The mu that we're comparing it to is 78.26. The S, standard deviation, 25.1. And the N is 100. And you'll notice that the T is automatically computed for us because it's using the same mini program we wrote last time. So the test statistic T is 2.05179 or 2.052. So now let's go ahead and compute the P value. So we have our H0 and HA, we have our statistics, we have our test statistic T. Our degrees of freedom are going to be n minus 1, so 100 minus 1, or 99. So we have a t with 99 degrees of freedom. HA is mu doesn't equal 78.26, so I have a two-tailed test. So I'm going to go to the right of 2.052, which we have here. But we're also going to go to the left of negative 2.052, which we have here. And to do this, we're going to ask Minitab to do some computation for us. And it's simple to ask Minitab to do CDF negative 2.052. That'll give me all the area to the left of negative 2.052. And that gives me 0214. So we have 0214 in this tail, and we have 0214 in that tail. Putting those together, that'll give me my p-value. So the p-value is 2 times 0.0214, or 0.0428. And then the question you have to ask yourself is this a large p-value or a small p-value? And normally we're going to compare the p-value to 0.05. So relative to 0.05, that would be small. So what do we conclude? We say since the p-value is small, we reject H0. Now most importantly, what does that mean to the restaurant owner? So he wants to state a conclusion in context. H0 was mu equal 78.26, HA mu was not 78.26, and he rejected H0. So his conclusion in context is, there is sufficient evidence to conclude that the mean of the bills in his restaurant is indeed different from his competitor's mean bill of 78.26. And that will conclude this presentation.